part of the rubric. It's the philosophy that the weak link on your work is the one that dictates exactly how strong it is. It's kind of like working in the real world. And so we try to prepare students for that reality. And with that in mind, I want to encourage everyone to please read the instructions. I don't want to sound like a smart aleck, but the majority of the questions that I get and the majority of the mistakes that I see would be cleared up if you read all the instructions all the way through and read the rubric all the way through prior to engaging the work. Because what I'm seeing is a lot of, uh, if there are four requirements, sometimes uh, students will have three of them that are just stellar. But that fourth thing, and it could be something as simple as missing a chart or missing a, notes, lecture notes or something that's asked for specifically in the rubric. If it's gone, then uh, that will cause you to fail that assignment. But do not panic. Almost everyone has to redo at least one or two things uh, at some point during the class. And uh, it's it's OK. You get at, you get up to three attempts, I believe. But I'm flexible and I'll, I'll work with you in any way that I can and help you clear up any uh, misunderstandings. So. With that in mind, uh, it's looking like a lot of you are on target to be at deliverable five or so. And that's really fortuitous because today's lecture is material that actually feeds into the fifth deliverable. So today's a good one. If you've done the first four and you're looking to uh, do number five, you're in the right place. So let's go ahead and pull up that content and get this show on the road. Hopefully you can see that now. It should uh, pop up as Deliverable 5 kickoff. What we're doing today is uh, we're talking about fault tolerance and disaster recovery. Concepts that you've read about, we've talked about, we've mentioned, and we're going to fill, uh, we're going to flesh that out just a little bit. Our objectives are we're going to be discussing things like disk configuration, the different uh, variations of a uh, RAID configuration. We'll talk about the Windows based replication and the NDS e directory partitions and replicas. We will discuss backups and UPS, something I actually had to deal with yesterday. Uh, first, we'll go into topic A, uh, system fault tolerance, and we'll discuss what that means and give you a good working knowledge of it. It's all tied to disaster planning. We've talked about how every data center needs to have a solid disaster plan in place. And if there's not one, you need to get one. You need to develop it based on industry practices and company policies. So when creating that disaster plan, there's some things you need, need to keep in mind. Just like I need to uh, speak more clearly, <laughs> need to keep in mind. All right, some key ideas to keep at the forefront. First of all, plan for the worst. We always hope for the best, but plan for the worst. And keep uh, at the top of your uh, a list of objectives there, a solid look at your environment. What part of the country do you live in? Are you near the coast like we are? And if so, you should have an eye on what to do in the event of severe storms and hurricanes because they happen every year where I live. That's just one example. Uh, implement physical data security. Protection planning is not always about natural environment disasters. It can be against malicious intent of people who want to steal data, uh, steal equipment, uh, gain access to uh, sensitive materials, um, that kind of thing. So ensure that there are layers of protection in that regard. We're going to uh, consider protecting your critical systems. And by that, we can mean a great many things, but most notably uh, systems that involve taking a lot of services and uh, propagating them into smaller services. For example, if you deal with OC192s and OC48s, that's where we take a lot of services and drop them into a single fiber. And that equipment there is a critical system, particularly if you are serving a large portion of the city or if you are feeding data and uh, and POTS lines to uh, sensitive areas like uh, hospitals, government buildings, schools. There are different configurations that we need to understand uh, in order to uh, have a serious conversation about fault tolerance. So there are some specifications in uh, the RAID system. So the specifications are RAID level 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and there's one that we can call 10 or you can call it 1 plus 0. Either way is correct. Um, a RAID 01 and several other 
composite levels. What we mean when we're talking about RAID. Now let's review. Both the book and the PowerPoint are weak in the RAID. So the PowerPoint will present materials out of order. I've tried to include uh, some slides on RAID from other uh, materials with some editing. And what we need to understand when we walk away is that the most popular iterations are RAID 0, 1, 5, and 10, or the 1 plus 0 for the purists. RAID means redundant array of inexpensive or some resources say independent disks. And more disks gives more heads and gives a faster transfer rate. And sometimes the read is faster and sometimes the write process is faster. And sometimes depending on the configuration, both are faster. Let's take a look at a basic layout starting with zero. Rate zero is uh, considered uh, zero in its disk striping, which is implying no parity is involved. The data is written across the disks in a single stripe. Now the stripe size is a multiple of two. It's going to be an even number and it depends on the RAID level that's in use as uh, RAID one and zero have a high stripe size, usually 128K, whereas RAID five has a low stripe size, usually around 16K. RAID zero offers no redundancy. Redundancy is tied to fault tolerance. It's it's a question of if a, if a component, a central core element of your system fails, can you recover quickly or do you have some type of a mirror that can carry the workload from that point on automatically? RAID zero does not have that. The two 128K stripes are data written in parallel. So note that because you can have the same amount of data, but written across two or more disks, you have more locations from which to read the data. And this can result in faster data disk reads, and uh, you can have two heads reading at once. The disk writing is also faster because you have two places to write to. The disadvantage with RAID 0 is, remember, there's no parity and no fault tolerance. Now, with RAID 1, that is uh, disk mirroring. You have a minimum of two disks, just usually a disk and another one that is a complete mirror of the other. If one fails, then the other simply takes over. And when reading, you can read from both disks because there's two copies of the data. It's a fast read and write process. Uh, reads are faster because you have two identical disks from which to read, but you have to write everything twice. So keep that in mind. It isn't as slow as it seems because you're using two controllers, which is a process we refer to as duplexing, but it isn't really fast either. So let's talk about duplexing. In RAID 1 or duplexing, what we're doing is we're controlling two different sections. You have two controllers actually mirroring each with a disk. So it's like mirroring, but with two controllers instead of one controller. So if one controller fails, then you still have the other one on that disk and it's fine. RAID 1 plus 0 is mirroring, then striping. So you've got a best of a both worlds marriage of technologies here. RAID 0 1, striping, then mirroring. So let's talk a little bit about RAID 1 plus 0 or RAID 10 or RAID 0 1. Is one superior to the other? Well, first we need to know that there's a minimum of four disks in operation. Why? Because the data needs to be both mirrored and striped. The massive difference comes to fault tolerance. So here we want to be careful. RAID 1 plus 0 allows for more fault tolerance because any disk can go. and there it should be a mirror of it and you'll be fine. RAID 01 has poor fault tolerance. You lose one disk and both mirrors and the RAID fails. So ensure that you're getting what you think you're getting. There is a difference. With RAID 5, 
a minimum of three disks are required. It uses parity to recalculate the data in case of a disk failure. And it involves the use of what we call an EOR formula. It's exclusive OR with one plus zero or zero plus one equals one or zero plus zero or one plus one is zero. Critical failure occurs when two disks tend to fail. And performance degradation on a single disk failure is an example. It uses a smaller stripe size in order to help out in the aid parity calculation. In RAID 5 data calculation, the EOR to calculate the parity and EOR to recalculate the data goes like this. Stripe 1 goes to disk 1. And the binary code is 170. Stripe 2 goes to disk 2. Binary code 189 and so forth. Now the parity stripe to disk 3 is 10101010 EOR or 10111101. That adds up to 23. So the data is written to disk 3. Now if recovery disk 2 has failed, the data from disk 1 takes over, takes parity from disk 3. And the data on the disk two is here. And this is conceptually what it can look like. You got your file server on disk duplexing on the CPU with two separate controllers, one controlling each disk or with one controller controlling two disks. That's mirroring. If the controller fails, then you're up the creek, as they say. Here you've got redundancy because it's duplexed. The same amount of data is written to both disks. Now, with RAID level five, we're working with, as we said, disk striping with parity. It's normally used on larger networks where data integrity is a primary concern. Volume sets combines space from up to 32 different drives. It cannot contain the system or boot partition. So if one disk area is destroyed, the entire set fails. This is a simpler version of the striped set because you have partitions of the disk dedicated to various functions. With disk striping, it combines space from up to 32 drives and each segment has to be the same size. So let's move on to replication. Now replication, what we're doing here is we're offering the advantage of data redundancy on Windows based networks. And it can specify certain data to be copied from a specific system to another specific system. And some common uses for replication include replication of login scripts, to all domain servers, replication of mandatory user profiles, replication of frequently used files across multiple servers to balance the server load. Replication is available in Windows NT networks, and it helps to copy the data automatically from a source system, which we call an exporter, to a destination system or an importer. The things we need to know about replication are, first of all, it runs as a background service. A properly established and well-configured replication system runs pretty much automatically, and it should be run after any changes. Files must be closed before they can be replicated. You cannot uh, replicate an active file, just like working with uh, a typical Word file. You can't go into it and move it from one folder to another folder while it's open. Everything has to be closed, saved and closed. And they can specify to replicate files immediately after a change in the subdirectory tree or on a regular basis. Individual subdirectories could be locked, and so you might require admin privileges. And an exporter can send files to importers. An importer can receive files from one or more exporters so they're not dedicated to the drive it can receive from uh, multiple sources 
within the same system. The import directory may be locked. And a Windows NT server might act as both an exporter and an importer. So there's that flexibility. In an active directory, the fault tolerance is built into the directory model. Every domain controller holds a copy of the active directory. And so uh, having said that, the fault tolerance is basically built into the system. All domain controllers contain an active directory and all active directories provide a form of fault tolerance. So we can say from that that all domain controllers essentially provide fault tolerance. When we're using a file replication service, uh, that's available in Windows 2000 and 2003 and up, and it replaces the LEN manager replication used in the old Windows NT. Uh, you probably won't even see that anymore unless you're in an older legacy system. And uh, it is used to replicate system policies as well as login scripts. And it allows for the file replication for domain-based distributed file system or DFS. Partitions involve creating a division of the NDS or eDirectory database, and it provides two primary benefits. One, you've got fault tolerance built into it, and you have an increase in performance because it is more efficient. In the NDSE directory partitions and replicas, they are used to store information about all of the objects known on the network. It is a blanket solution and functions as a logical division of the eDirectory database. The directory partition forms a distinct unit of data in the tree that stores directory information and other facts. Partitions can be created at a container level object like organization, organizational units, or any object marked and established as a container. An eDirectory has one root partition, which contains all the objects by default. And partitions are to be set up as parent-child objects. And it looks a little like this. You can see these NDS directory partitions include the root from the apex. And from each branch, we have different nodes. And they can operate independently as silos, but they're all together on the same network. Now remember, a replica is a copy or an instance of a user-defined partition that is distributed to a server. Each partition has at least one replica. Examples include the master replica, the read and write replica, and read-only replica, as well as a subordinate reference. It's important to understand an instance means that you have a clone of an existing partition, uh, some type of a, like a master replica, and any changes in one affect changes in the other. That's an instance. Any instance that's changed, everything is affected by it. There are six basic types of replicas. One, there's the master replica. Like the Highlander, there can be only one. The master is a read writable replica that controls the partition operations and the ob obituary process. This type of replica also performs these operations. It manages objects, all the add, remove, and move. It authenticates objects, which is important in security. It manages attributes, can add or remove attributes. And by default, it is the first server in the tree that holds the master replica of the root partition. Secondly, we have the read-write replica. Now, this replica type allows modifications to objects and will automatically propagate them to other replicas based on the timestamps. And you can designate any read-write replica as a master replica. Third, there's the read-only replica. This type is only readable, and it doesn't perform any write operations. It'll forward all writing requests 
to a read write replica. And the replica, the replica can be designated as a master replica. Fourth, we have filtered read write replica. Now this replica contains only a special set of classes and attributes specified by the filter. Replica can be written and the changes will be synchronized to other replicas. And filtered read only replica, as the name implies, the same rule applies. And this replica is the type that can only uh, will only filter the read write replica, but the replica is only readable. So all writing requests sent to the filtered read only replica will be automatically forwarded to the next writable media in line. And sixth, we have subordinate reference replica. These are system generated replicas that don't contain all of the objects, attributes, and values the same way that the master replica does. So it does not provide fault tolerance. They are basically internal pointers generated to contain enough information for the e directory to resolve object names across different partition boundaries. And you cannot create a subordinate reference replica. The e directory will create it when the server holds a replica of the parent partition, but not one of the child partitions. And it holds no partition data. It only holds information about the real replica holder servers. So it cannot be designated as a master without adding a read write function or read only replica. In a replica ring, this is a, a configuration made up of servers that hold replicas for that specific partition. The documentation for the replica ring might consist of a replica table, which contains a list of the servers, a list of partitions, and any types of replicas stored on each server. Now, a replica is not the same thing as a backup. Let's talk about backup and UPS. These are super important. You might find yourself in a spot like I was yesterday working in a data center, uh, minding my own business, and the uh, power team came through and tested the power transfer. Now, every once in a while in a central office or data center, one that's specifically backed up by generators and a system of batteries and so forth uh, will test the system in order to uh, prove that it's OK in the event of a commercial power outage. So they simulate a power outage by literally going to a big fuse box, box with fuses that are just almost the size of your hand. And usually there's three phases or more. And they'll throw one phase off and that will simulate a power outage. Power transfers to the generator. And then after 30 minutes or so, it'll transfer back automatically. And uh, the problem with that is if you don't have UPS systems in place and you're working on something important, it's gone. It's just what happened to me. <laughs> it's not that big a deal. I wasn't working on anything large that couldn't be redone. Um, but a UPS is uh, basically a battery uh, that will keep the power going on your sensitive systems long enough to uh, restore power and never miss a beat. But a backup is always necessary to protect your data and protect passwords and, and all that information in the event of a loss of power. Hopefully you've got battery backup and uh, generators if you have a large organization. There are three basic types of backup schemes. You've got a full backup, incremental backup, and differential backup. We're gonna talk about those three. And all, there is an alternative to tapes, uh, and that includes removable hard drives, a floptical medium, and rewritable CD-ROMs and DVDs, and they can provide a conventional way to archive data. Now, in backup storage, storing backups in your office is generally not a good idea. You could have a disaster like a fire or a flood, and not only the equipment is in danger, but the uh, data, if you got it on tapes or floppies or whatever, that can, uh, can be adversely affected. It is recommended to rotate your media with other uh, facilities that are off-site or commercial solutions. Uh, always keep backups in a secure access controlled location. And also have backups stored at off-site locations. 
Disaster recovery site options include cold sites, warm sites, and hot sites. Now we've talked before about them before. Um, remember that cold sites usually involve a single room in which your data center can be recreated in the case of a disaster. It can be on site or it can be off site, and it doesn't actually hold any equipment, thus the name cold site. Uh, coming back online after disaster can take a good bit of time, but it has the advantage of being cheaper. It's the least expensive site solution. Now, a warm site, by contrast, can be either on site or off site as well, but it contains a fair amount of equipment already to create a sort of a semi duplicate system of your current data center. And it can be live in much less time than a cold site. Obviously, it's going to be more expensive to create and to maintain. A hot site is a complete duplication of your current data center. It is typically off site and it can be uh, up and running in a matter of hours instead of days or weeks. Very expensive to create and maintain. And the uninterruptible power supply or UPS. Make sure that a server, it makes sure that a server is powered down and thereby, thereby protects network data. Keeps your system from going down automatically due to a loss of power. And it uses a battery to supply power to the system. Let's review a storage area network and network attached storage. PCI bus speed, a gigabit, 10 gigabit Ethernet. So, for standardization, the Internet Engineering Task Force, or e IETF, has approved the IS CSI standard since 2003. A mapping of the SCSI remote procedure invocation model on top of the uh, TCP protocol is a new standard S. CSI transport as defined by the SAM2 document. And equivalent protocols include SPI2, FCP2, and so on. And is there to take compelling advantages from the IP Ethernet infrastructure? For the layer in session, the conceptual layer model is the SCSI layer, which builds and receives SCSI command data blocks. The ISCSI layer builds and receives ISCSI PUDs. The TCP connections form an initiator target session. And what we mean by session is a group of TCP connections that link an initiator with a target and is defined by a session ID. So, what problems does the ISCSI? actually solve? Well, it provides a cost-effective solution for transporting the storage area network or the SAN as compared to a fiber channel. The ICSI enables affordable storage consolidation solutions, particularly in environments that are populated with mid-range servers. So together with a storage managed solution, management solution, the ISCSI also provides affordable disaster recovery, backup, and secondary storage solutions and that my dudes is where we're going to call the day for now i'm going to uh, be uploading these notes for you and uh if you have any questions about any of this stuff shoot me a message to dax.bradley at resmusen.edu i'll be happy to talk with you and provide you any additional resources if necessary and if you need anything let me know uh quick reminder there will not be a live session two this week it is thanksgiving week and uh, I fully expect everyone to uh, enjoy the day uh, with your family and friends, or if it's not your thing, enjoy your day by yourself if you don't have to go to work. Um, I am going to uh, make sure that it's on there, but I believe I've already uploaded a, a pre-recorded message, which is our uh, week eight lecture two uh, lesson. So it's there for you. And if it's not, I'll make sure it's up by tonight, uh, but I'm pretty sure it's in place. But I will get those notes up for you in the Teams page under Files and Class Materials, and you'll see it labeled. And uh, that's about it. You guys have a great rest of the week. Have a fantastic holiday. Stay safe out there, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Dr. Dex, out.